Welcome to Life Study of the Bible, a presentation of Living Stream Ministry. Witness Lee, a servant of the Lord for over seven decades, culminated his ministry with a 21-year book-by-book exposition of the entire Bible, which he called Life Study. This Life Study is the basis for our program today and includes short portions of the spoken messages given by Witness Lee. Now, let's join today's program. The Lord has committed much into the hands of his people. For example, in the Old Testament, Israel bore the responsibility of maintaining Jehovah's testimony on the earth. One of the key factors that the Lord was very eager to maintain among his people was their oneness, because their oneness reflects his oneness. The Lord is one, the Old Testament people would declare, and it is true. So, following the reign of Solomon, when the nation of Israel was split into two sections, a northern kingdom under the rule of Jeroboam, Solomon's servant, and a southern kingdom under Rehoboam, Solomon's son, this was a grave matter to Jehovah. And so it should be also to us today, as we consider and study the history of God's move among his people. The testimony of the oneness of God's people continues to be a vital matter to him, And it's a matter that is far too often taken for granted by his people. Francis Ball has joined us as we come to this portion in the book of 1 Kings and uh, chapter 11. It's a sober word, isn't it, Francis? It's a very sobering word and a warning to us today if we want to be an expression of God as one. Of course, uh, in the New Testament, we realize that God is triune and has always been. That means he's three, but it doesn't negate the fact that he is one. Israel in the Old Testament had an appreciation that God was one, and we need to have that same, uh, even though we realize he's triune. But this matter really uh, maintains and preserves his oneness, doesn't it, Francis? Yes, that's right. This is what really is mysterious, but marvelously incorporated in one God, that he's a father, the son, and the spirit. This is a marvelous reality and a blessed truth, and we should do everything we can to maintain this kind of testimony. In First Kings, of course, we see uh, Solomon now ascending to the throne, and a, a marvelous condition existed for a short time among Israel. Perhaps the highest that the kingdom of Israel ob- attained on the earth was under Solomon's rule initially. But then, uh, as we've seen in these recent messages, there was a serious deviation along a number of lines uh, his indulgence in, uh, you know, the matter of lust and his uncontrolled appetites that uh, he took advantage of his kingship to uh, indulge himself at every point, and then even how he somewhat used the people for his own gain. Uh, a number of these things were a serious offense both to God and to the people of Israel, weren't they? It was really sad to see that such a a son of David would have fallen into so much immorality and greed and went after things for his own self and for his own building up. When God intended man to be uh, his expression on the earth, and then he had raised up Israel Mm -hmm. in such a way to be this kind of expression, and then for the great one, Solomon, who had the wisdom to build the temple and to carry the people of Israel on, yet he got distracted to such an extent. This is really a sobering warning to all of us who have anything to do with the Lord's move. I think this matter of the temple that you mentioned, of course, as you said, it was not given to David to build the temple. He had the heart, but the Lord, in his sovereign arrangement, kept that for his son, Solomon, to actually build the temple. Uh, Of course, prior to that, there had been the tabernacle, and it was replaced by the permanent structure, the temple in Jerusalem, in the very spot that the Lord had uh, ordained that it should be built and established. That temple meant more to Israel than just a convenient place for them to come and make their offerings and to carry on the items that God had ordained as part of their faith in those uh, in that dispensation. It really was representative, wasn't it, Francis, of the oneness that God had ordained for his people. That's quite marvelous, isn't it, Chris, that uh, God had made such a decision for this oneness, and the main attribute of God himself is oneness. 
the one triune God is something that a mysterious fact that is concealed in God himself, but he wanted to express it in such a way that he got his people to have this desire to have a temple where God himself would meet with his people. Now, this kind of oneness is still in God's heart. And when we come to this chapter, we realize that there is this threat to this oneness to such an extent that uh, the oneness is really lost. By the time we get to chapter 11, we see that the Lord has kindled his anger against Solomon for these uh, problems, these uh, sins that we mentioned a moment ago. Let's pick up uh, a few verses here to give us a little more background. Beginning at verse 9 in chapter 11, it says, So Jehovah became angry with Solomon because his heart turned away from Jehovah, the God of Israel. He did not keep that which Jehovah had commanded. And Jehovah said to Solomon, Because you have done this and have not kept my covenant and my statute which I commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. However, I will not do it in your days because of David your father. I will tear it out of your son's hand, but I will not tear the whole kingdom away from you. I will give one tribe to your son because of David my servant and because of Jerusalem which I have chosen. So that's the scene that has been set up here. The Lord tells uh, Solomon in a prophetic way what is going to happen to the kingdom after his death and after his son Rehoboam would assume the throne. And in fact, those very things came to pass, as we'll see in the program today. We're going to begin, however, by hearing Witness Lee give, I think, a very interesting presentation on the different ways in which men have interpreted Scripture and the Bible over not just the years, but even over the centuries. And I think this will help us in our understanding of how we come to this life study of this uh, Old Testament books of history, First and Second Kings. Let's join Witness Lee. To understand the Bible has many ways by many different kind of people. I can never forget what Denise said, what can Bible you have according to what kind of person you are. So the inner life people understand the Bible according to their inner life way. The brethren were considered the best to understand the Bible. I regard the brethren teachings very much. Brother Nee did the same thing. It was Brother Nee who gave me John Nash and Darby's synopsis of the Bible, altogether five volumes. Six years ago, I went to Darby's synopsis again and again. But in these last ten years, the law has shown us something higher, something more profound. What is this something, dear saints? This something is just God's eternal economy, which Christ as the embodiment of the process triumph God, and the church and the organic body of Christ as the center and the reality, the brethren teachings. This stress very much on Ephesians 1, on God's choosing and predestinating, on God's selection of us and his predestination on us. They never point out that was a dispensing. And they never related God's selection and predestination is altogether organic. Ephesians 1 says, God had chosen us in Christ to be holy. You tell him what is to be holy. Who is holy? What is holy? In the entire universe, only God is holy. Then by what way God could make us holy as he is? By what way? By dispensing his holy element, by dispensing his holy nature into our being. 
Francis, this is a uh, very simple on the one hand, but very profound presentation, I would say, showing the clear distinctives of the approach that Witness Lee brought to the Bible when he did this life study, focusing on God's economy, even above the foundational, fundamental teachings, which we value and cherish. But we have to realize this is something higher, isn't it, that the Lord has brought forth. I really am thankful to the Lord for his revelation of this higher truth, because it's very easy for us to take the traditional teachings wherever we got into them at whatever level they were at the time we were brought to the Lord. But now we see that there is more, and the reason there is more and deeper truth is because these brothers, Watchman Nee and Witness Lee, would not be stuck Right. with any kind of traditional teaching, but still looking to the Lord for the clear revelation in his word. And seeing God's economy is the very safeguard to keep us in this line. God's eternal economy is to make man God in life and nature, but not in the Godhead. In other words, for God to become a man on the earth and for this man to go to the cross be resurrected, and be the firstborn among many brothers. In other words, there's a whole family of God-men in God's heart and God's intention. But this was always threatened by religion and by division. God's intention is to have his people to be one. And the temple you mentioned a while ago was an expression of that oneness. Right. That was what God wanted. But the person that actually was used to build the temple, Solomon, who was a very wise man, but he got very far away from God's intention and uh, caused a lot of damage to God's testimony. So God came in on that case and did, as we just saw, Mm -hmm. that he will take the kingdom away from Solomon and give it to his servant. So I think we'll see more of this when we hear Brother Lee some more. Yeah, let's come back to uh, this passage that he was uh, referring to to make this point in Ephesians chapter 1. Of course, the fundamental basic teachings largely we owe to the brethren writers of the uh, 19th century, the 1800s, uh, John Nelson Darby and his contemporaries. The Lord gave them a, a great measure in that period of time and opened up the Scripture in a marvelous way. And so many of our basic teachings in the Christian faith today are uh, really directly from that original source. Many of the great seminaries, even in America, were founded on those teachings. But one of the stresses of uh, Darby and the Brethren was um, our being chosen in him, establishing this as a, a, a primary element. But Witness Lee he finishes the verse, chosen that we might be holy. Yes. And how is it that we, the fallen ones, Francis, could be holy if there wasn't such a thing as God's economy, God's dispensing? Well, as he's pointed out, only God is holy. Right. The only way we can be holy is if God himself in his life and nature is dispensed into us. And this is the marvel of of God's economy. God's intention was to dispense himself into man. And that dispensing makes man holy. As we receive Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior, we got another life in us. Right. And this life is the very life of God, as we see from John chapter 1 and John chapter 3. We got God's life in us. This made us children of God. But not only are we children, we are growing children by the life divine that's in us. Right. And by that we become what God predestinated us to come, and that is to be the sons of God, to be heirs with Christ. We would be dispensed into so that this life would cover our whole being and we would become mature sons of God to be the body of Christ. Wow. Well, we take the foundational and fundamental teaching, and on their shoulders we stand and go even higher as the Lord reveals more in the coming days. Right. Let's go back to Witness Lee. I think he'll continue on this point a bit, and then we'll uh, surely come to this matter of uh, Jeroboam and Rehoboam and the division of the kingdom of Israel. The uh, fundamental teachings, they are gold. We owe them something. We are on their shoulders, but I must tell you, I became contented with the fundamental teachings as so many fundamental teachers. They are contented with their fundamental teaching, and that kind of fundamental teaching becomes a tradition. 
They don't like to be improved in knowing the Bible. They like to remain there. They're contending. Me too, 40, 50 years ago. But gradually, I saw one thing on Brother Nee. He was not contented with the fundamental teaching. He pioneered to see something further. He didn't have so many years on this earth as I do. He was imprisoned to death when he was 70. Today, in my bedroom, I only have one picture. Not my wife, not my children, not my parents. I only have one picture there. On the whole earth, I met too many Christians, not one like him. He was not contented with the fundamental teaching. He pioneered, but he didn't have this many years. Send the Lord mercy, the Lord kept me still today. 22 years after Brother Nee's death. Brother Nee's death was in 1972. Life study began in 1974, when I was 70, 21 years. In the last 10 years, the Lord showed me more. Mainly to show me the economy of the eternal God with Christ and his body as the center and reality. Francis, I don't think we... uh need to add too much there. That was just a word of personal testimony and very touching. I think it pretty well says what was in Witness Lee's heart. The Lord preserved him and did give him the opportunity even to uh, take what Brother Nee had seen, which was based on what all those who had gone before had seen, and to uh, see even more. How grateful are we? It's too marvelous. I'm just so thankful, Chris, that we could be living in the days when Brother Lee was here speaking these things which were higher truth than we ever dreamed we would see. never crossed our mind Mm -hmm. because we were somewhat contented with the fundamental teachings. At least I could say I was. I was uh, brought to the the brethren in the last 20 years before I came to the Lord's recovery, and I was very happy to see what they had seen and began to see more and more of the oneness of the body. But There was not the impact because there was not the vision with them of this matter of dispensing God's very life and nature into the redeemed mankind. So we just praise the Lord that this revelation has been brought to us, and we can be so thankful that this is the way God can make us a holy people by dispensing himself into us. Well, uh, we've got time, Francis, to come back to this point that we're looking at in uh, 1 Kings chapter 11 and chapter 12, and that is this principle, this ordained practice for the people of Israel that was uh, given to them in Deuteronomy chapter 12, where the Lord ordained that the one place of his choosing, which was uniquely Jerusalem in their time, would be the unique place that they must come to bring their offerings and to worship God according to his expressed desire. If you look in Deuteronomy 12, between verses 2 and verses 18, there are at least four mentionings of this matter in a very precise way. I've clipped a couple of them together just to make the point. Again, in chapter 12 of Deuteronomy, he says, "...to the place which Jehovah your God will choose out of all your tribes to put his name, his habitation, shall you seek, and there..." shall you go. And there shall you bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifices and your tithes. And there you shall eat before Jehovah your God, and you and your households shall rejoice in all your undertakings in which Jehovah your God has blessed you. You shall not do according to all that we do here today, each man doing all that is right in his own eyes. Then to the place where Jehovah your God will choose to cause his name to dwell, there you shall bring all that I am commanding you. And he goes on and repeats it again at least two more times, making this point absolutely clear that Jehovah had chosen Jerusalem uniquely as the place for his people to come with their offerings and to bring their uh, rejoicing and to really enter into the Lord's presence. Now, when we come to Solomon and his son, Rehoboam, 
we see that the kingdom of Israel is split and this principle is broken. And the servant of Solomon, Jeroboam, rebels and rises up and actually is, takes away 10 of the 12 tribes and establishes a second center in the north in Dan. Uh, no doubt conveying to them that it was a good thing because it made it far more convenient for them than to travel all the way down to Jerusalem uh, on the prescribed days. I think this is a marvelous truth to be brought to our attention because we face the same kind of problem even today among God's people. God has made it very clear that he wants his people to be one. Even the Lord Jesus prayed this in his final prayer before he went to the cross that we would all be one. That means all the disciples with all those that were brought to God through the disciples would all be one even as the Father and the Son are one. This was his prayer, and this was God's desire and design. But there's been division after division frustrate this oneness. And this is what we see with Jeroboam and Rehoboam in this portion today. So as you study the history of Israel from this point forward, we see all of the kings that followed in these two lines, the line of the kingdom of Israel, which was now centered in the north with the worship center in Dan, and then eventually many other worship centers, of course, sprung up, and the kingdom of Judah, which was maintained in, according to the principle in Deuteronomy, with Jerusalem as its center and the temple really as its center. In the line of the kings of the north, there were very few, if any, that ended up positively, were there? That's right. That was the sad thing because they lost the standing that God had ordained that there should be. In the line of uh, the kings following Rehoboam in uh, Jerusalem, in the kingdom of Judah, the southern division, the southern kingdom, there were a number of evil kings as well, but there were a number of kings that maintained a positive testimony uh, than that are looked back on in history as positive kings in the nation of Israel. So in the north, where the division took place, there was really no positives that you can uh, identify. In the south, at least a few, a remnant that maintained a kind of a positive testimony. Yes, and this is the way God works out his economy. In other words, what he wants is this kind of oneness among his people and also a oneness with him. And this is what God had ordained, and the southern kingdom kept this ordination. But Jeroboam's apostasy broke God's ordination of having one unique worship center and tried to set up another center. And he said, uh, probably he said something like, it's too much trouble for you to go to Jerusalem. But God had specifically made it clear, as you pointed out in Deuteronomy, that his sinner for worshiping him is Jerusalem. A few years ago, before uh, the most recent turmoil in uh, Israel and uh, the deterioration of the political situation, I had an opportunity with a number of other uh, brothers and sisters to travel to Israel And we went to the north uh, near the end of our trip, and we went to Dan. And the ruins of this um, center, this second center, are still there. And it was quite an experience to go there and stand on this second altar, one where there had been so much idolatry associated with it historically after, uh, you know, this initial division. Surely at the beginning you can imagine that uh, Jeroboam was speaking high things, wonderful things, and promising the people that they would really be faithful to the Lord. But what happened over the course of history was such a deterioration, and eventually it just became an altar of idol sacrifices and uh, something that could never have been pleasing to the Lord. It doesn't sound too different from what we face today among God's people, that there is that section or that larger portion which is just given over to everything other than the oneness and the uh, the temptation, the uh, explanation, and all the uh, excuses that are given to maintain divisions are really against God's economy and get against God's purpose. His purpose was the oneness, to be one people with one God, with one uh, practice, and even one sinner. Well, Francis, we uh, only had time today to uh, take pick up two of Witness Lee's portions. This uh, third matter, the matter of the division of God's people, is covered uh, in great detail in a good way in the printed Life Study message. And also, if any of our listeners have the uh, Life Study messages, when we did cover Deuteronomy chapter 12, I would say this would be another very good resource. If, you, if it's something that is of interest to you and you'd like to see how this Old Testament history really has an application and a lesson Uh, and a warning 
to our New Testament practice today. Strongly recommend both of these life studies, both the life study of First Kings and the life study of Deuteronomy. If you'd like to find out about the life study of Deuteronomy that we referred to or any of the other resources we have, we hope you'll call us toll-free 1-888-LIFE-STUDY, 888-543-3788. For Francis Ball, I'm Chris Wilde. Thank you very much for listening today. you enjoyed this program. For more information on Witness Lee and Watchman Nee, please visit our website, lsm.org. Again, that's lsm.org. Thanks for listening today. If you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe. Follow us on social media or visit our website for more from Living Stream Ministry.